Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Namwako Mari, and I'll be the moderator for this session. Uh, this session is essentially looking at um, reflecting on Professor uh, Lant's very provocative and informative um, keynote address, where he introduced us to three, I'll say three main vocabularies, as he liked to call it. Um, a framework which he then broke down into three main vocabularies. One, uh, he looked at and talked about growth dynamics, where he's looking at episodic uh, periods and phase transitions. And here he spoke about economic growth as a condition and not a characteristic. The second vocabulary he introduced us to is the deals versus the rules. Um, once again, looking at um, open or closed, ordered or disordered, and how this comes into play um, in looking at our institutions and how they actually implement policy. And the third vocabulary he introduced us to is um, economic product complexity, where we recall the uh, use of the Scrabble games. And essentially, the more letters we have, uh, the more we can diversify and the more that we can produce. Um, based on this, uh, our first uh, panelist who has uh, left us, Professor Benondulu, took us through the Tanzania's uh, transition uh, through um, this journey, looking at socialism through to um, Winyi, through to Mkapa, through to Kikwete, to the current administration, and spoke to the importance of clarity, the importance of uh, predictability, the importance of clear rules of the game. So he gave us the Tanzanian macro-level perspective. With this, um, I would like to introduce the next panelist, Dr. Ni Soa. Uh, who is the country director for IGC based in Ghana, to give us a broader continental view of what we've heard this morning and your reflections of the keynote. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I, I enjoyed the lecture, absolutely. It was interesting listening to you. Uh, there's no way anyone can sleep in your class. Um, and th there were very interesting thoughts also which came, came out of the lecture, which uh, I think we will all find very useful. But as I sat listening to the lecture, I asked myself again, so what is different about Africa? Because some of the things which were alluded to are in other regions, but they did better. Deals, we have deals in Japan. Japanese business is usually based on family loyalty. That, in my opinion, is a form of close deal. But it works, and it worked very well over there. If you take places like Malaysia, Singapore, and the rest, deals are there. But they made it. So why Africa? And, and then you can't you can't imagine what the answer will be. This is what uh, Paul Collier and others will say. It is the Africa dummy. It's an unexplainable thing that you cannot put your figure on. The fact is that Africa suffers from stunted growth because it's been fed and overfed on primary commodities. And because of that, the continent is not growing. We've had what you refer to as episodal growth. At one time, it would be Ghana growing consistently at about 7% over a five, six year period, and that's it. Then it goes to sleep. At another time, it is Tanzania. At another time, it is another country. We've had episodes. Of, of growth. We've not had consistent, sustainable growth on the continent. 
And that again, as I said, is because of the reliance on primary products, primary commodities, not value added. By not value added, we imply here that post harvest value added. Because I always think to myself, can we imagine the farmer taking a very simple seed and putting it in the ground, nurturing it and it grows and bears lots of fruit and then you are using it and you say he hasn't added much value? That's funny. So we are talking only about post-harvest value added. Now, if we want to think about that, then that is where the capabilities do come in. Because the amount of capabilities that you have in your country determines your place in the global value chain. If you have weak capabilities, the chances are that you don't have a role to play at all in the global value chain. Most of our countries have weak capabilities. There is research done by uh, John Sutton. I saw his name somewhere on the program. I'm hoping he'll be here. Uh, he did research on five countries mapping out what he did, what he called enterprise map mapping, where he examined capabilities in various countries. He used actually Tanzania, Ghana, um, uh, Ethiopia, Mozambique, and, and a, 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 a fifth country. In some instances, he found out that there were capabilities, local capabilities were there, which can be exploited to be able to enhance our place within the global supply chain. In other places, he found out that there were no local capabilities at all. So then, what is the trick here? The trick then is to promote more of regional integration so that within a particular region, we can exploit the capabilities within the region than relying on just one country's capabilities. That may be a way out for Africa, exploiting regional capabilities rather than relying on each country's capability. But even there, there, is, there are still weaknesses which we need to recognize. There is a research which was done on Zambia and South Africa in terms of regional value chains. And the results for th that research are not much different from when you are comparing Zambia within the context of global value chains. Why? Because, again, in this particular instance, South Africa just turned out to be the dominant factor. So South Africa was more or less appropriating all the gains from the value added uh, by way of, of, of remuneration for the, for the value added. Zambia didn't gain much in that. So we should think clearly, even within the uh, Africa regional integration kind of thing, what we can do to enhance capabilities within the regions concerned. If we can do that, we'll go forward. Similar examples can be given of the East African community. If you take places like Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and so on, and you look at the products, the products are virtually the same. And if you think about the capabilities, the capabilities are virtually the same. It means that we will not have the complexity of products if we rely on only our regional capabilities. And sometimes the politics of it also is what kills us. Because even in developing that capability, you are thinking about other issues in terms of the political economy. Take maize a staple food within this region. It's produced by virtually all the countries in the region, by informal sector workers. Now you want to develop capabilities to enhance production and products, more complex products within the maize chain. 
As a politician, then you begin to worry. What am I going to do with the excess labor that may come about? Or what am I going to do with this and that? You got to think about other things also. In other words, let's not just think about the economics of it, but the political economy is also important, even as we are thinking of value added and how we can create complex products. But indeed, we must create the complex products. Because otherwise, Ghana will just continue to explore, uh, export the cocoa beans. It goes out. And then we don't create the complex products, which are the food products that come out of it. We don't create the complex products, which are the cosmetic products that come out of it. We don't create the complex products, which are the fertilizers, which come out of it, and so on. These are all lost to us if we just export our primary products. And my final point, again, is on Ghana. Ghana has been exporting bauxite. We have an aluminum smelter in Ghana, but we export bauxite. And you know, the bauxite goes all the way to Jamaica to be processed into alumina ingots. And the ingots are then brought back to Ghana for processing into aluminum. There is more Ghanaian soil in Jamaica than Jamaican soil. Because we take away everything, including the soil and everything. Too. And any mining expert will tell you that for any mineral that you mine, there are complex minerals attached to it. But we sent all this, and all we got back are ingots for us to get our aluminum out of. I think I will stop over here. Thank you very much, Dr. So, for giving us that very uh, comprehensive beat short, and we'd like to hear more um, overview of what we can do at a continental level. And the very fact that you asked the first question is, is there something unique about Africa? That, that is indeed the question that we should be asking ourselves as a continent. You promote um, regional integration, uh, adding to the Scrabble letters. Uh, the more we can integrate and work as a region, we're adding our letters to be able to produce more go goods. But you point to the need for them to be complex, for the complexity angle. Um, I think that is a good springboard to introduce and to welcome our next panelist, Dr. Deborah, or Professor Deborah, uh, to now give us a more global um, picture in terms of wh what, is, what is happening and what, <laughs> what can we do in order to make this road towards building good institutions um, smoother or to, to go through the waves of the episodes. Thank you. Thank you, and it's a delight to be here. Um, I think I should explain, because my name was mentioned before as a sort of relic from the past, <laughs> so I hope I'm not as ancient as uh, it sounded, but um, it, let me explain that I was, uh, at the time of the founding of Repoa, involved from the Dutch side, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where I was working. Um, and the Center of African Studies at the University of Leiden. And I can report that at that time, um, the, my, insofar as I, I could see, the, it was just a straight foreign aid transfer, and I don't think anyone had the idea that they were insti bu institution building in terms of 22 years of solid academic scholarship and policy-oriented work. So well done. I've been enjoying the Rapoa reports for the last two decades, looking forward to more. But what really indicates looking out at the sea of, of faces is just how marvelously Rapoa has combined this, this mandate of bringing research, uh, government stakeholders together to really produce something worthwhile for the country. So congratulations. Now, moving on to um, the, um, the really fun presentation, I think we all enjoyed it, of uh, Professor Lant Pritchett. Um, I would say he's really quite a special economist. I hope you don't mind me um, saying so, but in that um, with 
these, uh, his eyes are on demography, demographic as well as economic trends, and I think that's quite special and gives a, a sort of um, edge to what um, he's saying on a behavioral level, which is so important. It really feeds into his, his uh, theory. Now, what um, I would say, I mean, and, and, and uh, just backtracking here, the broad range of topics that Lant covers is, 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 is truly uh, uh, amazing. Um, what I've done is, I, I have to admit, uh, for commenting on this paper, I cheated a bit because I hadn't been given the paper itself and I went to the internet and downloaded one that looked like it was, at least it was on deals. Um, so some of my interpretation, I mean my first um, encounter with this was through a paper and uh, so it might color what, um, what has been said uh, or expand or detract from, I hope not. But anyway, I, I looked at a paper called um, how business is done in the developing world, deals versus rules, uh, with Howard Dremere and Lant Pritchett. Um, and essentially, uh, I'd like to, like everyone else, use this tripartite um, division. I'm a geographer and a sociologist, but I'm going to deign to just say a few words about growth, because it struck me. And by the way, also, I want to preface this comment. I'm an academic, so I want to pick holes in the argument. Um, I want to be devil's advocate, and I want to find shades of gray, etc. cetera. So um, with regard to growth and the observations about a vulnerability to adverse episodes, what I think is in this, in this really this um, new terminology, it seems to me is that um, it is very interesting, useful uh, for spatial comparison. But I'm I'm missing the tem temporal dynamic and the specificity of, for example, again Africa and its sectoral transformation, because that tr transformation from agrarian to service to industrial societies is really profound and um, essentially has to be taken account. It's not just product complexity, it's the context, very, very important. Um, also, well, as we all know, it's a truism, but if you have an open economy such as Tanzania, you will invariably will be buffeting the, the waves, so to speak, and I'm not saying the calm waves of the Indian Ocean, but really, really heavy oceans. Um, and finally, I think we shall never ever forget in Tanzania what happens when you are in an open economy um, uh, subject to global uh, fluctuations, notably the international oil crisis of 79 and the structural adjustment uh, policies that were imposed in the 1980s, which put this country back 25 years, a whole generation. Okay, so, um, forgive me, that, that was just a, and aside from someone seeing it sociologically. Now, I'd, I'd really like to uh, probe the um, deals aspect, because that was really by far the most controversial part of the talk, I believe. Um, and I'd like to raise um, questions concerning the concept and the context. Um, certainly there was contrast in the paper and, and was hinted at um, in the, in the presentation that there's rules, regulations, and laws on one side versus deals. Um, and I'm thinking that, I'm, I'm wondering, as I read the, the notion of deals, um, it appeared that there was a lot of foundational work going on there in terms of how to um, see the, 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 the theory of rent seeking. Theory, the rent seeking theory a la Ann Kruger. One still sees parts of that, I would have thought, and please forgive me if uh, I'm wrong, or explain how deals has differed from various aspects of the rent theory and good governance. How is it different? How, how did it move forward or sideways or whatever? Um, secondly, um, deals, as it was described here this morning, oh, to me, rang of, of interpersonal relations. Uh, very, very important and, and really decisive, it, it, it seems. Um, 
And yet that's the whole field of sociology, politics, and anthropology. And I, I, I feel that um, we really, if we go in this direction, it has to be interdisciplinary because it, it can't be so easily modeled on a one-by-one -one case basis. Uh, uh, and we don't want just one-by-one -one case, cases per se, you know, the, the postmodernist kind of little vignettes and like, it's, it doesn't help. I think it's really important for economists, political scientists, and sociologists to get more into this. This is a very important and productive uh, field of inquiry, but it does need an interdisciplinary approach. Um, now, there's a paper I read raised interesting issues regarding the uh, relationship between deals and delays. And um, this is where the shades of gray blurred edges come up here, because if I'm understanding it correctly, um, so many countries feel that you know, they will get there when they have the right rules and regulations in place. Um, but at one level, adding rules and regulations can create delays, um, often because, of, of course, of the whole thing, that the rules and regulations are not implemented and it provides opportunity then for bribery and corruption of state agents and intermediaries of various descriptions. Um, so that's, it's a circular thing, that you can't treat deals and rules separately. Um, they, they, they are intertwined much of the time. Um, so then, now, I was asked to provide the international element here. So this, blame this on, on the organizers. But I'm going to let rip a little bit here and um, can't resist the observation that I'm sure is not a unique thought as all of us have been watching CNN and World Service BBC News of the last month or two. Um, this inferred dichotomy between developed countries and developing countries or between the North and the South Hmm, is, <laughs> I think that binary isn't, it's increasingly a blurred gradient, definitely, um, in a period when um, a great world leader, shall we say, the president of the United States is referred to as the ultimate deal maker, okay? And then today, um, let's bear in mind what today is, um, the UK is, about to jettison the EU rule book uh, so that deals thereafter will invariably, um, they'll be so complex, this transition, so complex, everything with the divorce times 27, um, and it will create delays, and I would have thought in, inevitably, um, irregularities. Anyway, I'm going to stop there before I really dig a hole for myself. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor uh, Deborah, uh, for introducing us to the shades of grey that it's not so black and white, it's not just about deals on one hand and rules on the other, but there are those uh, uh, shades of grey in between where the, the rules and the deals intertwine. But also pointing us at uh, the importance of context that in looking at uh, the complexity of products, uh, we have to also look at the context plus the temporal dynamic. Uh, going back to Dr. Soa, who uh, pointed the importance of looking at the political economy, and um, in the spirit of an interdisciplinary approach, as Professor uh, Deborah said, is needed, uh, I'd now like to turn to uh, Dr. Ali Bashiru, a political scientist, so we're already looking and at to get the other side, the political angle, uh, from the University of Dar es Salaam, Karibu Sana. Asante Sana. Barisam uh, Chana. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Bashiru Ali. Um, I want also to comment on three words or vocabularies, capability, episodes and deals and collectively you know 
I think we can understand these three vocabularies only if we unravel the class content. The class content of every deal, of every rule. Uh, and that's why, at times, we want to have capable institutions, yes. But not all capable institutions are legitimate. And we have had episodes where capable institutions have created social disaster globally. And in my mind, I have NATO in my mind. NATO is the most capable militarily institution in this world. So if we are interested in capable institutions, we must qualify that capability. Some capability can produce social disaster, and some capability can produce social progress. And I think our interest in this forum, I don't think if we are interested in creating capable institutions which can become monster. And NATO is one of our monster in our current days. I don't want to elaborate, everybody can say about it. So, capabilities are important. Institutions are important. But I think we need to, to, to understand that alternative institutions are needed to produce social progress. And therefore, I think capability must go together with credibility. And that's why I'm emphasizing about the question of legitimacy. Rules, there is no neutral rules. All rules are, have purpose. Apathet created rules. They had purpose. And those rules created institutions. And those institutions created havoc. So I think we need to be very careful about this. So if you want, you can kill efficiently. You, know, you can have capable institution which can kill efficiently, fastly, precisely. So institutions can be embedded with precision, consistency, but at the same time, uh, not progressive. On episode, and I want to come to Africa. There was a time when we had what I can call revolutionary episode. Where we resisted institutions of underdevelopment created by colonialism, which was dogmatic because at times we were told those dogmatic institutions. I call them dogmatic because they were not relevant to us and to any civilized society. And out of that episodic moment of resisting institutions of underdevelopment, we attempted to create some institutions. And in the list you can list nationalist political parties. Programs were created. The state intervened to ensure that human dignity is restored. That was episodic moment, revolutionary in all sense. That is 50s, 60s, and partly 70s. And in my mind, of course, we are talking about institutions. We are talking also leaders of those institutions, those who chart the direction of those institutions. That's where we got great names of Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, Nyerere 
Patrick Lumumba, who also <laughs> disappeared because of capable institutions that did not want him to continue to chart the direction towards social progress. What is the current episode? I call it the episode of neoliberal dogmas. Where we are forced to get into the deals which are not basically progressive in all senses, but regressive. A state institution, a strong state intervention? No, 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 no. That is going to distort the market. Yeah. And of course, you get the dealers in that context. Professor Sachage called them the pimps of free market. Or even those are dealers also. So to keep it short, what is lacking in this presentation and in the interest of multidisciplinarity, the class content is important. The class analysis is important. And the class interest that drives those institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bashiru, uh, for pointing to the need of our institutions to be credible and legitimate, and to look for alternative institutions as well, which are purposeful in, in nature. And of course, not forgetting the class analysis into our uh, discussions, which will be ongoing for the next day and a half. Uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. Tausi Kida, the Executive Director for ESRF, Economic and Social Research Foundation, um, who will now bring it back again to the socioeconomic and, and give us a sense of what is needed on the ground uh, through her vast experience in the development field. Karibu sana, Dr. Kida. Asante sana na habari ni zamchana. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Repoa for bringing this uh, very timely theme on the importance of institution in our industrialization-led uh, economy. Uh, as Tanzania now is embarking towards our vision 2025, and we are currently implementing our five-year development plan, uh, which is predominantly focusing on industrialization. The role of institution is very, very important. And currently, there have been a lot of efforts uh, by the government to strengthen our institutions and actually to have the rules of the games in our institution and how we operate our institutions very clear. So uh, the presentation this morning uh, uh, from our keynote address, I can say a bit uh, is bringing another angle of looking at things. I can say a little bit controversial as we are looking at the rules vis-a-vis -vis games and the difficulty of growth dynamics in the real, you know, in the deals world. So the aspects of uh, deal is quite new and uh, maybe a bit controversial in our in our context. Nevertheless, uh, I've you know, picked uh, four key aspects, whereas from the presentation this morning that we can learn as we are embarking towards our own process of development. First of all, it was very clear that economic growth alone is not enough. We need to sustain the growth, ensure that uh, the growth is inclusive, and by doing that, the role of institution is very important. Tanzania has been seeing remarkable economic growth, you know, for the last 10 years. Um, however, uh, what I can say, the linkage 
with its, uh, in terms of structural transformation and economic transformation has been very minimal and its impact to human development as well. So a lot has to be done to see how we can achieve the desired structural transformation and actually at the end of the day, this economic transformation, uh, economic growth to have impact uh, on uh, human development. So the important point that came out uh, this morning is it's important to remember that while episodes of very rapid economic growth are common, but uh, uh, Professor Lant warned us that uh, there is also aspect of uh, growth collapse. So this is important for Tanzania as we have, we have been enjoying this high uh, level of economic growth for a while now. You know there is a danger for collapse and how can we rebuild and our institution to ensure to ensure that we are actually avoiding the collapse. And my second point is on uh, institution will play a key role to ensure that Tanzania will avoid growth collapse. Uh, but the main challenge is how can we go about it? Uh, this is very important. There is a need uh, to see how we can achieve this positive institutional change. And uh, the address this morning um, by Professor Lant again, uh, he warned us that uh, for everything that we do, institution is uh, central. But whether the aspect of deals in that is enough, you know, to achieve this centrality of institution, this is again debatable. And my, my, my third point is on implementation. I think there was a very strong emphasis on implementation. Uh, what Professor Land said, we can have all these good policies, but if, if implementation is not there, then we won't achieve what we want to achieve. And in Tanzania, I see one of the drawbacks is actually it's important to think about our policy coherence. Uh, the five-year development plan acknowledges that there is weak alignment of policies, procedures, planning, and institutional coordination. And this reflect lack of consensus among stakeholders and sometimes ultimate affect our development management. So the whole aspect on how are we implementing the good policies that we have, but also how are we coordinating. So the aspect of coherence there is very important. But again, when we talk about implementation, uh, the second aspect is uh, uh, policy formulation in Tanzania happens mainly at the national level, but uh, implementation is happening at the local level. So the linkage between the national and subnational level here is very important, again, to achieve what we want to, to achieve. And lastly, my, my point is in, on the role of the private sector, uh, the capacity and also the role of private sector institution you know, to strengthen the private sector institution so that uh, to be able to engage in a meaningful uh, structural dialogue with the government at all level, coming to, you know, the larger level of private sector, but also the SMEs. So the, this is to ensure that the government, <coughs> the, the government actually will respond and support uh, the private sector in the development process. Thank you very much. Apologies for that. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Kida, for bringing out the final points as we, fi we, as we end this um, first panel of the workshop. We have heard um, a lot of information since morning until now uh, from the various presentations in the morning to our panelists and their uh, recommendations, suggestions, and, and what we should be looking at when we're looking at building strong institutions for industrial-led um, would be the best person to address them. So I'd like at this point to invite back uh, Professor Land to address some of the comments about, for example, the, the Scrabble letters, who actually holds the letters, credibility, legitimacy, and then also about the danger of having too many deals and what type of deals. Welcome back. So thanks for um, the nice feedback from the panelists and the previous panelists and the questions. Um, I am not going to go on at length since <clears throat> I don't want to get to, you know, any speaker between you and lunch is a very dangerous thing. Um, 
but let me just say briefly, I think all the issues raised are exactly the kind of issues that need to be raised. And when I say the, the, the title of my presentation was the difficult dynamics. And what I meant by the difficult dynamics is there are lots of ways to get stuck. You know, it, it might look like the, the, the ocean, uh, you can sail any way you want to get to good institutions, but in fact, there's many under, you know, obstacles just under the ground that can tear your boat up if you get off a quite narrow path. One of those, for instance, is, and so what are the difficult dynamics? One of the difficult dynamics is if you develop institutions that are about primary commodities and which the fundamental political settlement is about sort of how to deal with primary commodities, it's very difficult to move that forward to being responsive about the needs of manufacturing. So when you contrast Singapore and Malaysia with Ghana, part of it is that all of the institutions became about how to cope with the commodities that were there. Now, in some sense, many of the East Asian countries were blessed with a lack. They didn't have that, so they had to be by necessity into manufacturers, so they were forced to create institutions to cope with that. Um, uh, the second issue is, and I don't, I, I mean, <clears throat> what I wanted to be clear is that the dynamics are that you can't create institutions instantaneously. Institutions evolve through a dynamic, and it is a political dynamic, a dynamic that involves class and power and all of those issues. And one of the dead ends of that dynamic is precisely that the deals that create the original economic growth create illegitimacy. They're not legitimate deals, so I'm not, you know, no one would think it's progress to move from a rules-oriented society backwards, so I'm not a fan of Donald Trump going from a rules-oriented country towards deals. The question is, how do you move from deals towards rules? And in fact, the difficulty is, is you can get in a deals environment like Beno Ndulu was mentioning, in which the deal brokers are simultaneously so political powerful that they don't want stronger institutions. Because, after all, what strong institutions prevent you from doing is cutting whatever deal you want. So again, one of the difficult paths you can get in is you can get on a growth path that through sort of expeditious deals can provide immediate returns in growth, but actually undermines the credibility and legitimacy of the power behind those deals in the long run. So that's another difficult. One path you can get on is get onto stagnant institutions around commodity. Another path you can get on is that the deals lead you not towards rules, but away from rules, because they undermine the, the institutions that could eventually be the blocking of the deal broker. So if I'm a deal broker, the last thing I want is for the outcome for my, you know, the, for the outcome be determined strictly by the rules, because then I can't sell my services, which is intermediating the rules. So, so part of this is all about the dynamics. And, you know, there's a saying that you go to war with the army you have. Right? Well, you go, you know, in economic progress, you start with the institutions you have, and I think the process to be thought through carefully is how do you structure so that we deliver both economic performance and stronger, more credible, and legitimate uh, institutions that move towards a more open, uh, rules-based environment in the internet. And balancing that, again, is a very tricky shoals because many countries start with economic growth and implode because they've been building very fragile institutions. Other countries get stuck where they can't build the institutions of dynamism and innovation because they're stuck on a given set of commodities and their institutions are about reconciling those commodities. So part of what I meant by the difficult dynamics is manipula you know, guiding this is a difficult process and there's been many ways to fail, but also there are ways to succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lant. And thank you once again to the panelists um, for opening up the discussion for the afternoon and for tomorrow as well. I would just like to leave you with a question that was raised by the Honorable Minister in his opening speech in terms of what institutional architecture is actually needed um, to diversify the economy and to push the industrialization agenda forward. Um, I, th I thought that that was broad enough that can lead as to having um, a strong set of recommendations going forward um, to inform the government, particularly our government of Tanzania, as to how best to be successful in its agenda. 
uh, for industrialization. With that, I'd like to hand back to Dr. Bandina, and thank you very much.